So the long-awaited DLC trailer has finally been released for Elden Ring, and honestly, I am very excited about it. I have been up for days trying to analyse as much as possible about what we know so far. I have read through every interview, watched every single video, examined the trailer over a hundred times, and I am so tired I could fall into a sleeping coma. I will try and summarise and speculate on what to expect from the DLC, as well as throw my own theories as to what might happen or what we might expect from the DLC. I will be analysing both the trailer and the interviews with IGN and Famitsu to break down everything we have seen and heard so far about the most anticipated DLC in From Software history. Now before we get into the video, I just want to add a disclaimer that not everything in this video is going to be true, but I've tried as much as I can to analyse the trailer and the interviews with Miyazaki. I am going to bed now. If I don't wake up, you know why. Enjoy the video. Let's talk about location first. A lot of players have speculated that the DLC will take place here, over this fogged over area of the map between Limgrave and Altus. But unfortunately, this is not true. In an interview with IGN, Miyazaki said, First of all, the setting of the Shadow of the Earth Tree is a brand new land. It's a brand new map separate from the lands between. It is a land that is overshadowed by a particular shadow of the Earth Tree, as opposed to the Earth Tree in the lands between. And it takes place again on an entirely separate, physically separate map. In terms of setting and themes, it technically occupies the same space as the lands between, the same universe. In an interview with Famitsu, Miyazaki had this to say. It takes place at the same time as the main title. The setting is not in the distant past or future. So my theory is that, while physically disconnected from the lands between, the space in which this shadow land occupies is going to be around Lanedale and Altus, if not in the same space as the two. But how is this possible when a DLC takes place in the same universe within the same space at the exact same time isn't clear yet? We know that magic exists in the game, and that illusions are everywhere, which hide the truth about who people are, and that things are not always as they appear. Take Marika and Radagon for example, they are the same person, existing on the same plane, at the exact same time. Maybe the land of shadows we visit in the DLC, uses the same kind of illusionary spell to cloak its true identity, or intentions. We also see a veil in the sky, when we see the shadow of the earth tree for the first time. Famitsu asks, there appears to be some kind of veil in the sky, to which Miyazaki replies, yes, the Shadowlands in which the DLC takes place is shunned from the lands between, where the main story takes place. It has been removed from and hidden from the outside world, and this veil is the symbol of that. I feel like the veil has more than one meaning here, which if you've ever played a From Software game, you know that there have been multiple instances where the lore has had multiple meanings. The Earth Tree we see featured in the trailer, the close proximity to some sort of city, and the name of the title, Shadow of the Earth Tree, would also solidify this theory. Going more in depth about the Earth Tree, the trailer shows two trees, and since we know that one is going to be the Shadow of the Earth Tree, I feel like the second coral tree might actually be the Halig Tree. Its shape is very similar to that of the Halig Tree, and since Mikula did try and create his own Earth Tree, and that the focus of the DLC is on Mikula, I like to put forward a theory that this coral tree is the Shadow of the Halig Tree in the DLC. Some have speculated that this coil tree could be Godwin's death route, but since we know that the DLC will focus both on the Earth Tree and Mikula, I do not think that this theory of the second tree being linked to Godwin in any way fits the narrative trying to be told. We see a ton of different biomes in the DLC, including a lava area, multiple dungeons, some kind of Raya Lucari Academy, a version of Lanedale, and even a swamp looking area in the trailer. The DLC will also include figures that were shown to us in the base game, like the scholar that is depicted on the carrion inverted statue, some more Saint Trina imagery, and potentially even deathbed companions, again solidifying exactly where the DLC will take place. The actual size of the map is also debated. While Miyazaki has confirmed to some degree that the size of the map is comparable to Limgrave, in terms of scale or size, it's probably comparable, if not larger, than the area of Limgrave from the base game. It is larger and more varied than Limgrave in the main title. Miyazaki does have the tendency to downplay the actual size of the DLC that From Software have released. Many people have speculated that the download size is going to be around 12GB, since Elden Ring sits around 48GB, and the Steam page says we're going to need around 60GB of storage space. I think it's pretty safe to say that the DLC is going to be of a considerable size when compared to the base game. If I was to guess just how big the map is going to be, I feel like the size of the map's DLC alone is going to be that of Limgrave, Weeping and Kaelid combined. As expected, the DLC will focus on Mikla as a central character, with the entrance of the DLC being the cocoon, or at least his hand. The entrance is the cocoon, 
or the arm dangling from it, found in the battle area with Moog, Lord of Blood. Mikla is a central character in the story told in this DLC. But what I really want to talk about is how we're going to be guided through this new land. In the main game, we are guided by the Grace of Gold and Melina, who takes the player's hand and guides them towards Lordship. However, in the DLC, we will not have Melina to guide us. This is because the DLC will not affect the main story. The story of the DLC will be contained entirely within the DLC. So who will be guiding us in the DLC? I want to throw in another crazy theory, that it will be Mikla himself that will guide us in the Land of Shadow. Miyazaki said in an interview with Famitsu, I don't know if you remember, but the story of the main title following the grace was the simple path. Here you will be following the footsteps of Mikla, who headed for the Shadowlands. Miyazaki said this in an interview with IGN, so this land of shadow itself is a place where the player will visit to walk in the steps of Mikla. Mikla is a key part of the story this time, perhaps as guessed by many players who saw the art that was released previously. It is in fact Mikla, and it is he who travelled to the land of shadow. It's the player who will be tracing his path and following in his footsteps, trying to see what he's going to do there. Essentially, the player will be following the footsteps in the same way that they followed the blessings from the grace, the sights of grace in the lands between. They will be following in Mikla's footsteps, and these will guide them through the land of shadow and reveal that motivation to them. Mikla playing the role of our guide doesn't seem too far-fetched, but to what extent is yet to be revealed. However, I feel that he will appear as some kind of shadow, similar to how we see Kuro's memories in Sekiro. What's more is that the shadow of the earth tree will have some sort of new leveling mechanic. That is going to be similar to Sekiro, where we'll obtain memories of bosses in order to level up. This is something I will go more in depth later on in the video. We also see a golden icon in the trailer that might indicate Mikla's great rune, as we do get the Ring of Mikla gesture in the DLC. Also, we know from our time in the lands between that the Elden Ring we reforge isn't the complete Elden Ring from a time before the Shattering. In Malekith's boss room, you can see a depiction of the complete Elden Ring, but as we progress through the game ourselves, we only see fragments of it. We also see a sort of fragmented Elden Ring on the main title screen. I also think we'll gain more than just Mikla's great rune. Mesmir, for example, will probably be carrying one of these great runes since he is the child of Marika, but I'll talk about him more very soon. Since we do not know the exact number of great runes there were before, we can only really speculate on what happened to them or who might have one. Saint Trina will probably be a more predominant figure in the DLC and maybe on par with Mikla as his alter ego. We do see many instances in the trailer that symbolizes Saint Trina, including this field of purple flowers and some sort of sleeping enemy on the ground. We know purple represents sleep as seen with the sword of Saint Trina or sleeping pots that are crafted using Saint Trina's lilies. So we will more than likely see Saint Trina in the DLC. Since nothing has been confirmed about Saint Trina, we can only really speculate on whether we will actually see Saint Trina in the DLC. And my hopes is that we'll also fight her, maybe as Mikla's alter ego at some point. We may even have to fight Mikla as well since he does have a great rune. Queen Marika is going to be another prominent figure we will learn about in the DLC. In the interviews with IGN and Famitsu, Miyazaki said, The Shadowlands and Queen Marika's past will be told in the same manner, as the Shattering was in the main title. One of the main pillars of the DLC is the history of this Shadowland, and the history of Queen Marika. Another axis of the story is Queen Marika and what she did in the Land of Shadow. We know that Queen Marika hailed from the Land of Shadow. In fact, the Shadowland is where Marika became a god, and where the Ur Tree was born. But I do not think we will see Queen Marika as an NPC in the DLC. Also, one of the main pillars of the DLC story is the history of the Shadowland and the history of Queen Marika. As to what extent, or how much of the story will focus on the history of Queen Marika is uncertain. However, I do not think she'll be a more prominent figure as Mikula, since the story of the Land of Shadow will follow Mikula very closely, but she will be featured heavily throughout the DLC. The trailer also introduced a new character, Mesmir, and he is regarded as a heroic character within the DLC. The character of Mesmir shown in the key art is a good example. He is another hero. Mesmir seems to be an ally to Mikula in some sort of protector role, just like Melania was for Mikula. And just like with Melania, we will have to fight Mesmir at some point in the game, probably as an endgame boss. Mesmer is also referred to as a child of Marika, but if you know the lore of the game, those who are children of Radagon are normally depicted with reddish hair. Melania, Radan, Rani and Rikard are all children of Radagon that have the signature red hair, but normally those who are children of Marika have the signature blonde hair, Morgoth, Melina and Mikula. But what is more interesting 
is that those born from Marika and Radagon also have a very similar naming convention as well. Melina, Melania and Mikola. We don't know whether Melina is the daughter of Marika and Radagon, but there have been a lot of theories that she is the product of their union. Mesmer also follows this tradition with both the hair and the name. Mesmer is also a Berserk reference. You can see the inspiration his design has when comparing the two. There is also more Berserk references in the DLC, such as the Wickerman boss fight that we will encounter in our time in the Land of Shadow. As for Mesmer's design, it is quite an interesting one. His eyes for a start look like those who have partaken in Dragon Communion, and the snakes around him have also been considered in some cultures to be lesser formed dragons. The wings on the snakes also confirm this theory, that the snakes are lesser formed dragons, and that Mesmer is also linked to dragons in some way. Snakes are also known in the lands between to be traitors of the earth tree, as referenced by the dualist armor. Another way of confirming that Mesmer is linked to dragons, but also a traitor of the earth tree, is Rykard. Rykard's lore tells us, under the Golden Order, Rykard was a ruthless Justicar who commanded a company of Inquisitors. But after the shattering, he launched a blasphemous campaign against the Erdtree and the Greater Will, becoming a traitor to the Erdtree and the Greater Will. Rykard's design as the God Devouring Serpent and the description of the Duelist armor confirms that Mesmer is also a traitor of the Erdtree and the Greater Will. Also, the thrones depicted in the trailer are the same ones we see fighting Morgoth, where the demigods such as Melania and Mikla would sit. The chair Mesmer sits upon is the same one shown in the boss fight with Morgoth, the Omen King. He is on the same level of characters like Godric, Melania, Radan, and Rykard, and is referred to as the Child of Marika. But the position of this throne has changed to where the Elden Lord would normally sit, indicating that Mesmer could be, or at least in his eyes, would be the next Elden Lord. Mesmer will probably be carrying a great rune, since he is the Child of Marika and potentially Radagon. And since he has the birthright of a demigod, I think it is safe to consider Mesmer also having a fragment of the Elden Ring. Since we do not know exactly how many great runes there were before the Shattering, we can only really speculate on to what happened to them and who might have one. I don't want to get into too much lore behind Mesmer, but if you do want to find out more, then go and watch Vati Vidya's video on the secrets of the Shadows of the Earth Tree. Speaking of bosses, there's going to be quite a lot of them. Some are going to be side bosses and some are going to be main DLC bosses. We can speculate on which type of enemies are going to be boss types from the trailer. The Wicker Man, for example, is going to be a field boss. The large open plain, no other enemies around him and the whole look of the character seems to shout, I'm a boss, come and defeat me. The Lion Dancer in the arena devoid of any other enemies, which has also kind of been confirmed by Miyazaki, Yes, the Lion Dance, in some ways could be considered a very DLC-like boss. This Twinblade Knight that has a literal fog wall behind him, and maybe these Candlemen could be a boss type enemy, mimicking that of the Deacon's boss fight from Dark Souls 3 and the Shadows of Yharnam fight from Bloodborne. We also see a hippo-like creature, this melted horse skeleton-like creature, this sleeping enemy on the ground, and the mounted boar rider, who could also mimic the Knight's cavalry from the main game. There's also this red dancer enemy that might appear as some sort of NPC boss fight and is probably a reference to the blue dancer or his opposite. We do see opposites depicted in the base game, NPCs such as Dee and Fia and Yora and Eleonora for example. So this red dancer could be the opposite of the blue dancer. This might also mean we might see the blue dancer at some point in the game, but this has not been confirmed. And of course, Mikla himself, which also will be a boss fight at some point. As to the extent of how Mikla will be a boss is uncertain. It might be him or as his alter ego, Saint Trina. This might even be a two-phase boss fight where we'll have to defeat both. There is also a ton of weapons to expect from the DLC, as well as eight new weapon types. Six of them we can see from the trailer. Martial arts, dueling shields, large katanas, throwing weapons, reverse swords, and repeating crossbows. First of all, there are the fairly classic large Japanese katanas, known as Odachi, and others are reverse hand swords, Keiatku Ken, and more peculiar, high novelty ones. For example, martial arts if you imagine monks, or dual offensive defensive dueling shields, and throwing daggers that will change all attacks into throws. I feel like we might get a new sorcery and incantation types that differs from the sorceries and incantations in the main game. I also feel like we could get some kind of candlestick type weapon and even colossal spear type classes. Honestly, I am most excited about martial arts. I cannot wait to be a monk and kick people in the head like the British person I am.
the DLC difficulty in the game is going to be on par with the main game in terms of how you approach it. Yes, with regards to stats, it will follow the latter half of the main game. However, what is more interesting is the way that From Software is approaching the difficulty within the DLC. We'll be able to level up in the traditional way with our runes, but there is also going to be another way to level up while inside the DLC. This new leveling mechanic is going to be similar to Sekiro, in which we have to defeat important bosses and use their memory to get stronger. Think of the attack power system in Sekiro. Separate from the original level system, there is an attack power. This is also DLC exclusive, so we won't be able to take this across to the main game, only enabled in the DLC areas. I feel like this has been done to balance out the DLC so that those entering the DLC with a high level character don't just completely blast through it. This was introduced in order to give freedom to meet the threats mentioned earlier, so you could do something like explore other areas before going back to challenge bosses that were too strong the first time, allowing you to more easily experience this even in the high level range. On the other hand, keeping your attack power low, you can also experience this challenge at a lower level. The DLC will not affect the base game at all. It seems to be self-contained. There is no separate ending. The story of the DLC will be contained entirely within the DLC. So I think it's safe to say we will not see any of the characters from the base game in the DLC either. People were hoping to see Melania in the DLC as the gloom-eyed queen, but I feel like this just won't happen. Also, some people have speculated on whether the new spells and incantations will affect the Gideon boss fight at the end of the main game. But if everything is contained within the DLC, I do not think he will be able to learn the new spells or incantations from the DLC. That being said, I feel like Gideon may mention something to the player in Roundtable Hold about Mikola that will direct them to how to access the DLC area. But other than that, don't expect anything from the DLC to affect the main game. And lastly, we shouldn't expect another DLC for Elden Ring in the future. While it isn't completely ruled out, Miyazaki did have this to say. No, at this point, we have no plan to release another DLC after this one. In terms of DLC being added to the main story of Elden Ring, I think this will mark a large milestone. However, I do expect that we will see a sequel from the game in the future. As Miyazaki said, that is not to say that all of Elden Ring has come to an end. I may have said the same thing with Dark Souls 3, but I don't want to make any decisive statements to rule out any future possibilities. Honestly, we won't know much more until closer to the release date of the DLC on the 21st of June. So much of what I've said is just educated guesses and speculation. But how do you think they line up? Got any theories that you want to share yourself? Feel free to comment down below. I would like to hear what you think. Also, if you feel like leaving a like on this video, then go smash it. Also, consider subscribing. I don't normally do these videos, but I wanted to try it out anyway, just to see if people will engage with it. But I normally do challenge runs on Elden Ring. And if you don't subscribe, I'm going to make sure you get banned from purchasing the DLC. But as always, my friends, peace out and stay awesome. And thank you for watching.